Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Let's all stand. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have power on this earth because we have power with God. Let's, let's sing. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. You know it? Sing it with us. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Yes, it does. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. That's all awesome. you know it. So when I find out, find on my knees with my hands lifted high. Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. When all I see is a cross, God, you see that empty church. Stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Let's sing together. Now, Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine. seated in his presence. Good morning, church. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Welcome, guests. We're so thankful to have you with us as well. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Again, it's that time of the year in which we're taking up shoe boxes. So you will watch a brief video, and then after that, Je uh, 
Jason, the guy that I work with, will come up here and he will share uh, some instructions with you guys after the video. Three, two, one! And when those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. This is amazing, as you can see, the children's faces, they are excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just a child, but a whole family. So we need to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. And again, we're so excited that we can partner with this organization. So instructions on that. First and foremost, if you haven't gotten your shoebox, go ahead and get it today. We just have a few left in the foyer, so you can stop by there after church. Then the shoeboxes will be due next Sunday. So you'll bring them with you into the service because at the end of the service, we will have a special dedication time that the shoeboxes will be brought to the front and we will pray over those. Because not only is this an opportunity for you as a family to talk about missions and the need for missions, but these shoeboxes will go all over the world, not only providing gifts for these kids that may not get it any other way, but also to share the gospel. And so that is the most important part, is that for these kids to be able to learn and know that God loves them and sent the gift of Jesus. And so continue to partner with us as we do that. Also, as you bring your shoe boxes, please include a $9 check in each of the shoe boxes. You can just put it right in the shoe box and that will be for shipping. So we'll need that to be able to send it as well. So at this time, let's pray for the shoe boxes, for the families that are coming together to do that, and we'll pray for the service as well. God, we come before you. We thank you for this time that we can participate in this missions opportunity. Father, that families, that parents, grandparents, uh, kids can come together to share uh, the need for missions, the opportunity to take care of somebody else. Father, that you give us so much. And this is our opportunity to give to somebody else. Thank you for uh, the gospel, the story of Jesus, that we can use these shoe boxes to share that story with others all throughout the world. And Father, I pray for uh, each shoe box that comes in that will be uh, prayerfully uh, prayed over. And Father, I just also pray for the service as well. Be with Brother Doug, be with Derek as they continue to lead us, as we have this spirit of worship that we know you are in this place. So thank you for having us here and being with us at this time. Show us what you want us to learn being in your presence. In your precious son's name, amen.
that's your testimony. Let's all stand together and sing the rest of the song together. Let's stand. So here's the keys. Come on. second graders let's move you may be seated first and second graders I mean they're coming from everywhere that's awesome let's sing this wonderful hymn of our faith you know that scripture is so true they that labor labor in vain unless the Lord builds the house aren't you glad that he's in the middle of our house building it aren't you glad of that he's doing it Let's sing this wonderful hymn of our faith. Praise him, praise him. That's what we're here to do. Let's sing together. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing over his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Of our children in his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbound and wonderful deed of song. Praise him. Excellent greatness, praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Father, we're so glad to be in your house. So appreciative for the things that you do for us every day. The gift of life. Never let us take that for granted. We are proud to be part of your kingdom and diligent to do the things that you've commanded us to do and that is to love you with our whole heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Teach us to strive to receive the faith that was once delivered to the saints. We're so glad to be in your service. Anoint our pastor with a fresh word from you. Give him revelation even as he's delivering the message today. 
and we receive that. We thank you for allowing us to worship you in spirit and in truth. I lift up every family under the sound of my voice, those who are going through tough situations, those who are not. Teach us to pray for each other and let the strength of the strong lift those who are weak. We love you so much. We have so much to love you for. Give us great grace as we bless your holy name. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes I fall to my knees and pray. Come, Jesus, come. Let today be the day. Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna pray, but I'm holding on to a hope that won't fade. And come, Jesus, come.
Good morning, church. Let me invite you to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 through 44, will serve as our focal text for today's message. We are continuing in a series of sermons based on the lives and legacies of select biblical characters. Some of you may recognize the name Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman was without a doubt one of the most colorful, and controversial characters to ever play in the National Basketball Association. Based on his physical appearance, you might think that Rodman would fit in better at a carnival than you would on a basketball court. His long and lanky body was literally covered with tattoos and numerous body piercings. Rodman, during the latter years of his career, changed the color of his hair as often as some of his teammates changed their socks. In his last season with Detroit, Rodman sported hair that was black, Blonde, green, blue, and red. There were even some occasions when Rodman's hair contained a combination of those colors. In addition to being a colorful character, Dennis Rodman was also a controversial one. His explosive temper and rebellious attitude resulted in numerous technical files, fines, and suspensions. In spite, of, in spite of the fact that he was a highly paid professional basketball player, his offensive performance was anything but impressive. Dennis often missed uncontested layups. He shot a very poor percentage at the free throw line, and he 
had one of the lowest game, points per game average in the entire NBA. Well, due to his poor appearance, his attitude, actions, and poor offensive ability, one might wonder how Dennis Rodman not only survived, but went on to have an extremely successful career spanning 14 seasons with different teams. And there was one factor that made Dennis Rodman a superstar. That is his ability to rebound. When Rodman concluded his career, he was the all-time leader in rebound rate and is still regarded today as being one of the greatest rebounders in the history of the NBA. As a result of his colorful appearance and ability to grab the ball when it came off the rim, Dennis Rodman might well be labeled a radiant rebounder. This morning, I want to focus our attention on a biblical character who is also worthy of this same nickname. The person to whom I'm referring is Joseph. Based on the coat of many colors he received from his father, as well as how many times he bounced back from adversity, we might classify Joseph as being a radiant rebounder. So notice with me now what the Bible says about him in Genesis chapter 41, verses 39 through 44. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You should be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and all men shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word no one will lift hand or foot in all Egypt. The subject of rebounding is one that every Christian needs to carefully consider. This is a timely topic because there will be multiple moments in all of our lives when we miss the goals we're shooting for in life. Our desire, dedication, and determination to rebounding after those shot, missed shots or opportunities will have a significant impact on our ability to achieve success in life. This is clearly illustrated in the life of Joseph. Throughout his adolescence and young adult years, Joseph encountered numerous severe trials and tribulations. Had he given up after the first miss shot, Joseph would have been a failure in the game of life. But to his credit, instead of throwing in the towel, Joseph determined that he was going to be a good rebounder. So there are three major points I want to call to your attention this morning about Joseph, the radiant rebounder. Note first, Joseph's perception. A careful study of the life of Joseph reveals that Joseph had a keen perception. There was something, even though he didn't know what it was at a time, that God wanted to do both in his life as well as through his life. And this perception was rooted in a couple of dreams Joseph had. The first dream, Joseph dreamed that he was out in the field working alongside his brothers. They were binding up sheaves. And Joseph's dream, as he related to his brothers, was that his sheaf suddenly stood upright and his brother's sheaves bowed down before him. Now, let me tell you, this dream did not go over well with his brothers. They were already jealous because of the preferential treatment that had been bestowed upon him by their father. And so they did not like the idea of having to bow down to their younger brother. Joseph's second dream was similar. This time he dreamed that the sun, moon, and 11 stars bowed down before him. And his family interpreted this to be his father, his mother, and his 11 brothers bowed down before him. And so Joseph's family was highly upset with him. I'm not sure if Joseph used good judgment in, in sharing those dreams, but keep in mind that his brothers were outraged about this and were determined to take advantage of him if they ever had an opportunity to do so. And this jealousy reached a boiling point one day when Joseph's father sent him out into the field to check on their brothers who had been out there watching over the flocks for an extended period of time. When Joseph arrived and he discovered that his brothers had moved on to another location, so he eventually tracked them down. And when his brothers saw him coming, they said, that's our younger brother. <laughs> no doubt he's going to cause us some more problems. We've got to do something to get rid of him. And so they thought about just killing him. But Reuben, the older brother, said, look, look, let's just put him in a well and we'll decide what to do later. And Reuben went on about his business thinking that he would come back, release Joseph, and send Joseph running home to their father. But while Reuben was away, an Ishmaelite caravan came along. And his brother said, why don't we just get Joseph out of this pit and we'll sell him to these Ishmaelites? And that's what they did. 
And so all of a sudden now Joseph had been sold into slavery. The apple of his father's eye. He, he's now a slave. And they take him down into Egypt. And when they arrive there, they sell Joseph again to Potiphar, who was an official in the reigning Pharaoh's palace. And so now Joseph has been sold not once but twice into slavery. And on top of all this, it wasn't long until Joseph was attacked by a cougar. Not a four-legged cougar, but a two-legged cougar. The Bible says that Joseph was well-built and handsome. And Miss Potiphar saw him, and she got some ideas. She began to try to seduce young Joseph. But to his credit, Joseph refused to give in. And after multiple attempts, he ran out one day. She grabbed his robe, and he just ran out from under it and took off. And she was so outraged after being rejected by this Hebrew slave that she called people in and said, this slave has tried to physically assault me. And as a result, Joseph found himself in prison. While he was in prison, he, he met a couple of the Pharaoh's servants, the baker and the cupbearer. And these men had dreams while they were in prison, and they didn't know what their dreams meant. But Joseph said, well, I'll interpret them for you. The baker <laughs> did not like the interpretation. He was about to be put to death. But Joseph told the cupbearer, Pharaoh's about to rise you up, restore you to your position. And when he does so, please remember me to Pharaoh, Tell him what I've done for you and that I've been incarcerated for a crime I did not commit. But as soon as the cupbearer was restored, he forgot all about Joseph. So this brief account of, of what he went through makes it obvious that Joseph's perception that God had a special plan for his life did not make him immune from the pain, pressures, and problems of life. What it did was give him the strength to keep on keeping on in the face of those pains, pressures, and problems. Make no mistake about it, Joseph faced more than his share of stressful situations. But to his credit, instead of giving up, Joseph stayed in the game. He did so by choosing to rebound from adversity. I suppose Joseph could have written a book on rebounding. One chapter would have been how he rebounded after he was sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, another chapter, how he rebounded after being accused of a crime he didn't commit. There's still a third chapter about how he was, had to rebound after being forgotten by people he had befriended. And here's what we need to understand, as was true of Joseph. Here's where the sermon comes and speaks to us. Each of us need to perceive that God has a plan for our lives. One does not have to be born into a prosperous family or a family that's well connected politically for God to have a plan for his or her life. I believe that God has a plan for every person present today. Those plans may vary from one person to the next, but God knows you and you owe your very existence to God. Here's what the scripture says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Sadly, far too many people miss God's plan for their lives because they allow themselves to be defeated by adversity. How many people face pains, problems, and pressures and just choose to throw in the towel? Go and get stuff at school, maybe high school, maybe college, and you just decide to drop out. You lose your job and you've allowed your identity to be associated with your career and you sink into the valley of depression you have problems at home and you just throw in the towel on your marriage one of the distinctions between winners and losers in the game of life is that winners are those people who choose to rebound Please understand, you're not going to make every shot you take. 
The ball is not always going to bounce your way. And when this happens, we can either react or respond. We can react by cursing and crying, becoming agitated and angry, or we can respond by choosing to do everything we can to put ourselves in a position where we can rebound from this adversity we have experienced. In preparation for today's message, I I took some time just to review some prominent people who were considered to be successful. These men and women I, I looked at come from different backgrounds. They lived in different parts of the country. They went to different schools and pursued different careers. But there was one common denominator that linked their lives, and this is a common denominator that is shared by every person who has achieved success in the game of life. And that is successful people are familiar with stressful situations. They've all made multiple mistakes. They've all faced failure. They're all acquainted with adversity. They've all experienced ridicule and rejection. And instead of giving up, they've chosen to rebound and move on with their lives. And this is what we must do if we hope to achieve success. Jesus was right on target when he said, in this world, you shall have tribulation. Now, this goes against our way of thinking. We want to believe that when we give our lives to the Lord and try to live our lives for the Lord, we're going to experience unprecedented prosperity. That our children are never going to have a runny nose. That we're going to get every promotion we hope to achieve. We're going to get the raise. Everything's going to go well. But the fact of the matter is, when you study biblical history, you'll be reminded that tough times come to every person's life. And because we're going to face adversity, it is imperative that we determine this very morning that we're going to make every effort to be radiant rebounders. We're not going to give up. We're going to hang in there and keep on keeping on. This brings us to the second thing I want to call to your attention, and that is Joseph's perseverance. Rather than allowing his problems to defeat him, Joseph chose to persevere. Both biblical history and secular history are filled with examples of people who chose to persevere in the face of adversity. One such rebounder was Harry S. Truman. In 1922, Truman was 38 years old. He was deep in debt and unemployed. Seven years later, he had ascended to the highest office in the nation, President of the United States. Think about that. Deep in debt, didn't even have a job, and seven years later, he's the president. Because he chose to persevere when he could have given up and said, I'm just going to file for bankruptcy and just give up on life. But he hung in there, and he became president of our nation. Another prominent person who overcame a lot of adversity was Mary K. Ash. As many of you may recall, she is the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. Her story illustrates the importance of perseverance when it comes to being a good rebounder. She had this idea to to come up with this cosmetic company. And so she went to see her attorney, and she told him what her plan was. And he said, Mary Kay, if you're going to throw away your money, don't even invest in this business. Just go ahead and put it in the trash can. You're going to fail. It's not going to work. Her accountant told her the same thing. But in spite of their efforts to discourage her, she moved forward. She sank $5,000, her entire life savings, into this new business venture. She put her husband in charge of the administrative uh, role, and she began to, to devote all of her efforts to preparing the products, designing the packaging, writing the training materials, and recruiting consultants. They were making wonderful progress until one month before they were scheduled to open, her husband was sitting at the kitchen table and died of a heart attack. Most people would have given up, but Mary Kay decided that she was going to persevere by becoming a radiant rebounder. Anybody know the name Irma Bombeck? She was a very successful syndicated columnist. When she was in college, she went to see her advisor, and her advisor said, give up on the idea of writing. You just simply cannot write. But she decided she was going to hang in there anyhow. And then she faced multiple other problems. She came down with breast cancer. She went through a mastectomy. She had kidney failure, and she had multiple problems with her children, as you may recall. Another name that needs to be considered when we talk about people who choose to persevere and rebound is Hank Aaron. 
On baseball's opening day in 1954, Hank Aaron played his very first professional baseball game. He went 0 for 5 at the plate. People were speculating if he's going to make it. You know, 0 for 5, this guy probably doesn't deserve to be playing professional baseball. But to his credit, Aaron never doubted himself, and he chose to persevere and become a radiant rebounder. And then a final person I'll call to your attention is a man named Bernie Marcus. Bernie Marcus was a son of a very poor Russian cabinet maker. Bernie worked for a home hardware company called Handy Dan. Bernie got fired from that low-paying job. But he said, the fact that I may have failed does not mean I'm a failure, and I'm going to persevere. I'm going to hang in there and become a radiant rebounder. Perseverance leads to a payoff. Notice Joseph's payoff. Joseph had a perception that God has a plan and purpose for my life. And I've got to go through the school of hard knocks in order to get there, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to persevere in spite of every problem that comes my way. And eventually the payoff came. Joseph got out of prison. The cupbearer finally said, oh, Pharaoh, you've had a dream. You don't know how to interpret it, but I met somebody in prison who can do that. And so he introduced him to Joseph. And Joseph came up with a plan uh, to become the administrator of Egypt by collecting all the overabundance of the harvest and storing it so they'd have food to eat when a famine came. The Pharaoh was so impressed, he said, Joseph, I'm going to put you over everything. You'll be second in charge in the entire land. And so Joseph's payday finally came. God had shown him when he was 17 years of age in a dream, you're going to be a leader among people. And now after going through all these tough times, Joseph hung in there and he was well rewarded. The same can be true of those persons I mentioned a moment ago from secular history. On September the 13th, 1963, Mary Kay Ash launched her business. She now has more than $1 billion in annual sales and employs 500,000 direct sales consultants. I would think that Mary Kay became successful when she chose to be a rebounder. What about Irma Bombeck? The guidance counselor said, give up the idea of writing. She went on to write, and she was a syndicated columnist. Her columns were carried by more than 900 newspapers. And before she died, she was recognized as being one of the top 25 most influential women in America. She hung in there. She did not give up. What about Hank Aaron? Hank Aaron didn't just quit and say, I can't hit the ball. He, he kept working and working and working. He's now been inducted into Baseball's Hall of Fame and was recognized as being the all-time leader in home runs. What about old Bernie Marcus, who got fired from his job at Handy Dan, at Home Hardware Company? He teamed up with a man named Arthur Blank, and they decided to start their own business. So in 1979, they opened their first location of Home Depot. Are you beginning to get the picture? Here are people who faced adversity and they said, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to hang in there and make the most of my life with God's help. Every Sunday morning, there are people sitting on pews who were excited, enthusiastic about life. And there are people who are sitting there saying, life has beat me down. Pastor, you don't know what I've been through last week or last month or last year. It's tough. And I'm trying to come to church and worship the Lord. But there are times when I want to cry out, God, life just isn't fair. Can you imagine how many times Joseph must have felt that way? God, I'm pursuing your purpose for my life. And I keep on encountering adversity. Maybe Joseph thought about giving up. But he remembered those dreams. And he remembered God has a plan for my life. And I want to hang in here until I discover what it is. Maybe that some of you here today may be 16 or you may be 61, but you still haven't perceived God's plan and purpose for your life. And you feel like you've just been going through the motions and counting one problem after another. I want to tell you, hang in there. Don't give up. Be a radiant rebounder. Keep on seeking God's face and God's plan for your life. 
One of the tragic trends that we are witnessing in our nation is the increasing rate of suicide. People who don't just give up on their careers, on their educational pursuits, or their marriages, but people who give up on the game of life and choose to take their own lives. Life's not going to be easy at times. I remember hearing a story many years ago about Arnold Palmer preparing for a tournament. The tournament was scheduled to begin the next day and some fan drove up and he saw Arnold Palmer and Arnold Palmer was out there chipping out of the sand trap. And he said, Mr. Palmer, you're one of the greatest golfers in the world. What are you doing practicing out of the sand trap? And Arnold Palmer replied, life is not always velvet greens and smooth fairways. Sometimes you find yourself in the sand trap. And when you do, you've got to make every effort to get out and still achieve success. I'm talking today to a congregation filled with people experiencing different emotions, people who come from different backgrounds, people who know a little bit about success, but also know a little bit about failure. There are people here today who have been through some very challenging economic times, but they've hung in there and they've gone on to achieve success. And they could tell you that what the pastor's saying today is accurate. Hang in there. Keep on keeping on. Don't give up. A part of the Christian life is showing that through Christ, I can do all things because he gives me strength. And when I give up and I give in, I'm projecting very poor testimony about the power of God. We serve a God who brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. We serve a God who parted the waters of the Red Sea. We serve a God who fed the Israelites with manna from heaven and gave them water from a rock. We serve a God who made blind eyes see, deaf ears hear, and lame feet walk. We serve a powerful God, and what He's done for others, He will do for you. Hang in there. Don't give up. Keep on saying, God, with your help, I can make it through this trial. I don't have to live in the valley. I've just got to go through the valley. But when I go through the valley, you are with me, and you're going to see me through. And so today, hold up your head. You serve a great God, and you need to project a testimony that my God is still able. He is able to do all things, and he's going to give me the strength. I may not be a famous person. I don't have to be a famous person to be a successful person. I just need to perceive God's plan for my life and pursue it with a passion. Maybe God's plan for you is to be a great mother, or be a great grandmother, a great father, a great grandfather. Maybe to be a business person who, who hires other people and gives them an opportunity to have jobs in life. Whatever it is God has for you, you be the best you can be. Maybe as an educator, maybe as a coach, use your position of influence in a positive manner to give others hope, to give others help, and most of all, to help them learn the way to heaven is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because through him, we can do all things. Bow with me, please. Father, what an encouraging father you are. Thank you that you never give up on your children. Help us to determine today that we're never going to give up on you. You're a faithful father. You're a father with unlimited resources. You're a father with unmatched power. You're a father who's perpetually present with us. Help us to trust you, Lord, and determine that when problems come our way, we're going to persevere because we know you've still got a plan and purpose for our lives. Even it's that to use those problems for us to let our light shine in the midst of darkness so that people can see that you make a difference even during dark days. So today, Lord, may we receive the message that's been shared in a very personal manner, Lord. Let it impact our lives in such a way that we become better people and we walk closer with you. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning and respond to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. As God speaks to you about any commitments you need to make, you be the first to slip out and come this morning. We welcome you here at First Baptist Church. If God leads you here to be a part of our family of faith, you come. You come today.
be seated for just a moment. I have a couple of things I want to share with you before uh, Matt comes and concludes with some announcements today. Keep in mind that as Christian citizens, we have both an opportunity as well as a responsibility to vote. And I would never tell you how to vote, but I will tell you to vote. And so please be responsible about this matter. This is, may well have a huge impact upon our nation. And we're living in a, in a nation where we need to turn back to God. So you pray about how you should vote, and you be sure to go and vote as you have an opportunity to do so. I had no intention of saying what I'm about to say or bringing this to your attention this morning, but I, I was talking to Jessica this morning about this. It, Every week I've been telling you about somebody else who has passed away unexpectedly. And this morning I received a phone call while it was still dark from Ann Givens telling me that her daughter, Abby's husband, Matthew Marks, had passed away in a fatal automobile accident uh, after the LSU-Alabama game last night. They have two children and another child on the way. Life is fragile. Life is fleeting. It's imperative that all those little things that get us sidetracked, all those things that cause us to become agitated and irritated with one another, that we put those things aside and we truly love God and one another. This is a difficult time for that family. And while we don't always do this, I want us just to take a moment of silence prayer. We pray for the Gibbons and Mark's family this morning. Would you pause with me, please? Father, I thank you that you are a refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. And I claim this verse on behalf of these families today. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew and Abby typically sit right over here to my left. Every Sunday morning, Abby was here Wednesday night. We never know when our number is going to be up. If there's any commitment to Christ you've been thinking about making, don't delay. You make sure you're right with God and that you're living your life for God. The Bible says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Be sure you're ready when your number is up. God bless you. Thank you for the privilege of serving as your pastor. May we be found faithful individually and collectively as a church. Matt. That's right. And if you have any questions about the Lord, about Jesus Christ, if you want to know more about Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'll be down here at the front. I'd love to answer any questions that you have about Jesus. Or maybe you'd just like to join First Baptist. I'd love to receive you at the front at the end of the service. Don't forget the offering boxes as you leave this morning. And then uh, just a few announcements before you leave. Just one, uh, the 2023 budget presentation is going to be on Wednesday, November 16th. And then the vote for that upcoming budget is going to be on Sunday, November the 20th at 10 a.m. Don't forget, again, to pick up your shoe boxes in this foyer as you leave for Operation Christmas Child. And then we are feeding again this Wednesday. We'll have our fellowship meal this Wednesday, 515 in the Family Life Center. And then tonight we will have our on-campus Bible studies at 5 o'clock p.m., adults in the sanctuary, young adults over in Family Life Center, as well as children and students. And then today is Dollar Day. So if you get your dollars ready as you leave, you'll see guys at the door with blue buckets. You can put those dollars in as you leave this morning. There it is. It's so precious. Let's all stand and sing Make Us One. Make sure to continue to pray for that family. We love you. Thank you for our visitors who are come that came to see us today. Please come back and see us again. Let's sing, church. Make us one, Lord. Make us one.
you. God bless you.